you see the grenade and time stand still. kind of stops, you know? Everything becomes slow motion and your whole life flashes before your eyes. When heaven calls your name and heroes march away through this life to the sunset of December you won't be forgotten Hey everybody, welcome to Backstage Pass. My name is Jeff Senior, your host, pilot by day, rocker by night, and we uh, feature amazing people doing incredible things in this life. Today we have a hero, not the hero you hear or see on TV or in storybooks, but a real hero, a real hero that sacrificed, that's given it all for our country, for our freedom, and it is my honor and my pleasure to welcome Medal of Honor recipient, Mr. John Baca. John. Thanks, my friend. Thank you for coming out. Here's the Medal of Honor. Oh my Hall. gosh, thank you, thank you. These coins are a, a treasure. And um, so, John, I wanna talk about your story. You, uh, first of all, very few people know, uh, or a lot of people don't know what Medal of Honor is and what, what that means. And the way I explain it, and you can maybe expand on it, is that out of all the military that serve, which is less than 1% of our population that serve in our military, there's even a smaller percentage that ever obtain the highest honor bestowed by the President of the United States, which is the Medal of Honor. As, a, as far as I know, there's only 71 still living Medal of Honor recipients. So tell me about John Baca and Medal of Honor and your story, how you you know, when you enlisted and when you went into the service, you know, where'd you grow up? Uh, well, I lived in, I went to, lived in San Diego and uh, went to high school there, had moved from Massachusetts. My stepfather adopted us when we were young and back there I was a runaway and I was always a ward of the court and it followed me when I went to, uh, San Diego, just in and out of juvenile hall, and and uh, go out for sports, but it never showed up for practice, out partying somewhere. But and I think eighth or ninth time in juvenile hall, you know, for burglary, the judge sent me up to youth authority and stayed a year there, and did my senior year in high school, uh, YTS on Ontario and. Then I guess on parole for a year and a half, and then I got drafted f February of uh, 69. So it's during the Vietnam then, conflict, yeah, right? Which was in full swing at that time, right? Yeah, flew over to Vietnam in July of 69. How old were you then? 20, uh, 20, 20, 21 years, 20 years old. Yeah, back then, you know, you in and out of trouble with the law, either go to jail or go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So, did you have a draft number? Yeah, I was drafted. Okay. Yeah. What? What? So, how? <clears throat> it must have been kind of a shock at 20 years old. All of a sudden, you're like on a plane heading into a war, a war zone. And what was your uh, what was your job in the military? Well, I, in basic, you know, we had 16 weeks of basic training, four door, and one fellow I hung out with was Rodney Marinelli. He was a coach for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and then Detroit Lions, and he was like an inspiration to me. And another fellow, Leonard Rabago, kind of like three of us, the three musketeers, you hung to inspire each other in the physical training courses. And I flew overseas with Leonard uh, with Rod Marinelli, and we separated when we got in Vietnam. But it, it just, it was a whole different, the, the smell, the humidity, and, and you hear when you get off the plane, you hear the word, people yelling at you, short, short, you know, they got maybe 30 days or less ready to come home. And wow. So we're in there to take their place. Wow. And then we, you get training uh, 
four or five days, they tell you, forget everything you learned in basic training. We've got five days to train you to this is the real keep world. you alive in the jungles. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So would you, how did, and I'm always curious, how did, do they send you out on a, on a mission and then you come back? Is it like a day or two or is it a, a week or, you know? Well, we were, I was in a Delta company, first of the 12 Cav and company size. So like 100 people maybe or a little less, a little more and four different platoons and, you know, six helicopters drop us off in a big field or a couple, you know, bring mm -hmm. the whole company out and then you you draw fire and you're in an open field and and some of the jets that would fly over and drop their bombs in the wood line and shrapnel was flying back at us and, and I just thought I'm going to get killed my you know wow. first week in country by by our own people and but uh we had a you know the, a lot of the guys who the Afri African Americans we saw call them soul brothers they re-upped stayed a, a a second tour because we were green and they were uh you know they watched out they were our big brothers and, and the Chicanos the blacks and the whites we all got along together because we were all out in the field together and in the foxholes together and his brothers in arms mm -hmm. and uh, there was one fella from Watts we called him Fragman he carried a dozen grenades tall over six foot and uh, when I got in country, I was his assistant for the 90 recoilless rifle, and they'd call him out to stand up, shooting flushette rounds into the wood line, and I'm hugging the earth, and he's dragging me out there because I got his rounds, and I ain't going out there. Says, you got my round, yeah, you are, but he's standing <laughs> up a beautiful target, and I'm kissing the earth, but if a grenade came in, his body was on top of mine. No, a soul brother just uh, covered me, protected me, and that's how you had that natural instinct to look out for each other, and and you always you always forget, you always remember that. And when he left country a couple months later, I ended up carrying the ninety re recoilless. So. Mm -hmm. oh. And to me, a story like that is all reminds. <clears throat> it should remind all of us that we're all human. And all the, it's funny in our world today, we see so much, I, I see so much hatred and so much, so many people at odds with each other. And what a world we could make it if we just put a little more kindness in it, you know, and helping each other out, you know. And the, and the military, that kind of camaraderie is, I don't think most people can ever experience. None of us have, most of us have never been under fire. You know, I shoot guns, you know, yeah. as fun, as a recreation, it, but um, I've never been shot at, and I can't imagine. Well, and we would stay, you know, maybe 20, 30, 40 days out in the field and get supplies every three days, and, and uh, I never smoked, I never drank, and he had a four-pack cigarette, and well, after when I wasn't carrying the 90, or we were heavy weapons, fourth platoon, and the other platoons were always walking point, alternating, and and they had their meetings, company commanders, the platoon leaders, and they got mad at us. They, we had to start walking point, and that was an eye opener. It was a beautiful country, and you were alert, and and I always felt there was. I, w I went overseas as a, a born again believer in, in the Lord Jesus, and carried my Bible and and uh, trade off my cigarettes for fruit, you know, extra water or uh, fruit cocktail and the old sea rations that go back uh -huh. to two, World War II, I think. But, right. but some in, remarkable things happened when I walked point and you always sensed there was a, you had your guardian angel, you know, they're walking as your point man and there was just a beautiful sense Frightening and scared, but it it worked out, you know. So tell me about I came back. Tell me about uh, how, how long had you been there when the particular incident happened that earned you a Medal of Honor? Well, I got there July fifteenth, sixty nine, and it was February tenth when I put my helmet on a grenade and covered it up, and it blew up, but. Christmas morning of 1969, I was my time to walk point, and 
I snuck up on a North Vietnamese soldier sitting on a bunker, and I heard him speaking to a couple other voices. I could hear voices, and had I not, I, I motioned for the, our squad to be still, and I disappeared because I wanted to go down and check that voice. Had I kept going, I would have walked us in. We would have got blown away. I would have walked us into an ambush, and if I would have survived, I'd live with that guilt, and probably would have been a suicide case. But, but I saw this guy. I distracted him, and and he was sitting on a bunker. And I got him to come over by the bamboo, go like that, and I ran down and picked him up and threw him on my shoulders. And I came back to our team, and Baka, where'd you get him from? He was right in front. He was the enemy but, soldier. Yeah, okay. and he, I took him alive, and we. And we brought him in the open area so the helicopters could get him. And we gave him our worst food, and he loved it. And he had pictures of his family. And I had pictures of my mom and my sisters, and we shared them. And, and I'm thinking, how do I relate this? No one knows what's going over here back in the world, back in the US of A. Right. You know, people got families all over that love them. And, but uh, I'll, that was a beautiful experience. And, and then I walked up one time point on a little helicopter with two Americans in there, probably dead for two weeks, decomposing. And, and you know, that you try to throw all those memories over a cliff, but you, they come back every now and then. And, yeah. and I knew, like, there was always a heavenly presence. I always sensed it. And, and it was nice. And well, they, the grenade episode. It's February 10th, we had just come in from the bush 20, 30 days, and usually have five days guard duty sitting on a bunker and preventing being overrun, you know, it's your time, but that's when we fall asleep because we didn't sleep out in the field hardly. But, uh, well, we were alert, but uh, when we, our squad that we call the bunker busters, we had to carry the 90 that day just, in the evening, we went out just to obs by, uh, observe a trail. There was movement, you know, not open up or nothing, and just report movement coming down the trail at nighttime. And, and then you set up some booby traps, trip flare wire, or grenades and uh, Claymore mines, and somebody ended up walking down and set off the Claymore mine. You hear yelling and screaming, and, you know, the Vietnamese coming down the trail. and and a couple of our people went out and they were receiving fire and then I had the 90 and I said, Baca, get out here with the 90. So I went out there and, and they were, you being fired at all over and, and I guess, I don't know, I think I may have fired one round, I don't know. You know, you have to let people wear the back blast, you know, mm -hmm. get down and fire in the hole and, and the, but then I guess a grenade, all of a sudden you see it, it was near my friend Art James, and it's like you see the grenade and time... Stand still. ...kind of stops, you know? Mm -hmm. Everything becomes slow motion and your whole life flashes before your eyes and I saw my mom and my sisters and, and I try to reach and grab them and they just disappeared. And, and it's just like a few seconds, but it seems like longest time, but I remember falling, I pushed Art out of the way, and I, I thought, do I pick it up and throw it? Where did it come in from? And will it blow off my hand, or do I run from it? it I'll get hit in the back, I'll be paralyzed in a wheelchair, or somebody else is gonna get wounded from it, and, and I just, I remember, Jesus, forgive me for everything I've ever did wrong. Yeah. And, I took the helmet off and put it on top, and and it was like slow motion, falling down on it, and and I screamed, and I I thought about my mom. If she knew I got myself in the situation, she'd be upset and I'd break her heart, and she'd scold me, and and then as soon as I screamed, it blew up, and I'm laying on my back, and I wasn't sure if my legs were still there. You were conscious. I couldn't still? feel them, and were you still conscious? Yeah, I was I was conscious. I was awake, and my stomach was coming out, and and I there was no pain, 
you know, I just, the stickers were bothering me and I was thirsty because I lost all the fluids and here's the intestine still coming out and my Lieutenant John Dotson, we still stay in touch, he retired a colonel, works with the wounded now at Walter Reed getting, fighting ISIS. Mm. You know, he volunteers his time, but he came nearby because he was down the outside the, he, well anyway, he came by, he laid next to me, trying to remove the burning metal from my stomach and washing my intestines out. And, and he said, don't close your eyes, Baca. I'm closing, I'm going to sleep. I can <laughs> feel the angels holding me, someone's holding me. It's like holding your little, a grandbaby in your arms or a little puppy or a cat that cuddles up and I felt that invisible presence just holding me and no pain, I, was, I wanted to die and I was ready and, but uh, it didn't happen. And Art, they move us back on the helicopter and Art and I were holding hands and, and we still stay in touch after 49 years. He lives, I lived with his family on the East Coast and we did farming together and and we went back to Vietnam in 1990 for six wow. weeks. September and October up in the north outside of Hanoi and that fella that I took alive Christmas in 1969, he was, he, he was there at the work site working with us and, and all those Vietnamese, they, we worked six weeks, a 10 room clinic and they were, we brought joy back to them coming back and being a part of what we destroyed during the war. And, and they, uh, when it was time to leave, they would pick you up and just hold you and they would, they would, they would sniff you just to remember what your scent smelled like and we're all crying and touching each other's tears. And, and one fella, he wrote a poem on a conical hat or when you wake up to the sound of the wind it's the calling from your Vietnamese friend. When you wake up to the sunlight, it's the eye light of the Vietnamese children. If you wake up to the raining, it's the tears of the Vietnamese worker who love you very much. Mm -hmm. If you wake up to nothing, it means war comes to our land again. Mm -hmm. And I'll always remember that. And, and Art and I, we helped sponsor, brought back an Amerasian girl with her husband and two babies a year and a half later and they settled in Maryland. Wow. But what a joy. And we met some of the Americans who stayed over there. They fell in love with the country. They never trusted anybody from the government to see if they were alive or not, but they heard what we were doing and they said, thanks for coming back and doing what, yeah. uh, why can't more people come back? Yeah. What president gave you your medal? Because uh, they're I, all given by a president. Yeah, I, I got my medal from uh, Richard Nixon. I spent a year at Balboa Naval Hospital and it took me a year to grow a mustache and then I, I went to <laughs> Southern California College and I had a couple of classes at Fullerton and I was in Costa Mesa and I, my old minister was the president of the college, Emil Ballier, and he got a call from the Pentagon. I was gonna see Richard Nixon at the White House summer of June of, mid-June 15th, 71, and he makes the announcement at graduation that I'm the most popular guy on campus, you know? Wow. Well, I, uh, I think, uh, and you know what I think? I think God had more plans for your life because you've de dedicated so much time of your life in honoring this country and educating others about service and, and uh, giving back to our country. And uh, that's where we met at Snowball Express and the, the Gold Star families. And um, if you had one, one statement real quickly that you could say to our youth, let's say to, what, what, what might it be? Words of wisdom from John Baca. Uh, the younger generation, you know, get off of the mechanics, the phones and, Find out where veteran homes are at. They're forgotten about or visit elderly people in nursing homes. Mm -hmm. Spend some time with them. And, and Jojo's my, he keeps me from having seizures. Hey he's, Jojo. He's Jojo. 11 years old, a standard <laughs> poodle. And I take him to a nursing home every now and then. He sees somebody in a lobby in a wheelchair and he, 
he eases his way up and he lays his head on their lap and they'll remember that. Before we go, I know you had something special. Yes, I do. I, I like to present to you, oh Jeff. Oh my gosh. The, uh, You're kidding. Wow. Medal of Honor book, 150th anniversary when it was first given out at, uh, during the Civil War. So it's yours. I signed it. I'm on page 200. John, thank you. Thank you. What an honor and a pleasure. Yeah. It's not often you get to talk to a real hero, a real life hero. And John, thank you for coming on the show. Folks, thanks for tuning into Backstage Pass. It's been my pleasure and my honor, and we hope that you tune in again. This is Jeff Sr. Thanks again for coming on. <laughs>